studying subatomic structure, uh, we go back uh, a bit more than 100 years to a series of experiments conducted between 1908 and 1913 by Ernest Rutherford, Hans Geiger, and Ernest Marsden. And they were scattering alpha particles from radioactive decay. They, they didn't really know what they were. They knew they were positively charged, uh, produced in radioactive decay. They had a, a, a radium source, actually. And uh, they, um, a beam of radioactive decay particles is impinging upon a gold foil. So I think aluminum foil, just a little more expensive. Most of those went nearly straight through. So as you can see in this just sort of schematic diagram here, most of them went nearly straight through. This was consistent with the prevalent ideas about the structure of the atom at the time, the so-called Thompson's plum pudding model, which some of you may have studied, which said that the there were positive and negative charges inside atoms, but that they were basically randomly or homogeneously distributed throughout the volume of the atom. So if I have a charged uh, beam, a charged particle from this beam passing through the gold foil, passing um, through an atom, the idea was that uh, it would move near some uh, positive charge, but it wouldn't be so far from some negative charges because they're about equally distributed through the volume of an atom. And so it, it should only get deflected um, at small angles uh, because the positive and negative charges were, were both going to be nearby. Uh, however, they saw that about one in 8,000 bounced back. I think this is also a, a nice uh, example of how it's important to do your experiment more than once and more than five times. So you might think that, you know, they did it a thousand times and said, oh, you know, we know what's going on. They basically all go like this. They had to do it tens of thousands of times or hundreds of thousands of times before you get even more than that, right? Uh, millions of times before you get enough statistics to even you know think of the first one you get like this you maybe you think it's a fluke uh, but if you can uh, collect enough statistics you see that on average uh, it's pretty consistent you have this average of one about eight thousand bouncing off at some kind of sharp angle uh, like this one this one or this one uh, and so what they concluded was that atoms in fact, have a small positively charged core. The, the positive and negative charges were not equally distributed throughout the volume of an atom. And we now know this to be the nucleus. And they were looking at gold. Gold is a, a large uh, nucleus. So the atomic number of one of the common isotopes of gold is 197. So 197 protons and neutrons. And this is just um, the size in atoms, size in meters here. Uh, um, so this uh, is the nearest order of magnitude. So this one in 10,000 is rounding of one in 8,000. If you go to a hydrogen atom, so you just have a single proton as the nucleus, this is, ends up being about an order of magnitude uh, smaller. So uh, about one, uh, one one hundred thousandth of the radius of an atom. So in meters, uh, an atom, nominal radius of an atom would be about one angstrom, 10 to the minus 10 meters. Uh, for a large nucleus, uh, the size of a large nucleus would be about 10 to the minus 14 meters, and the size of a proton is about 10 to the minus 15 meters, or one femtometer. So if you think of a hydrogen atom, it's five orders of magnitude, uh, so between the size, the radius of the proton and the radius of the atom. So if I think of a grain of sand, so say it's about one millimeter, the dimension, so 10 to the minus three meters, and then I think of a football field. We, you know, the faculty in the physics department have been trying to convince uh, the athletics program to change the football field to metric and make it 100 meters for a long time without success. Uh, but if we estimate it's about 100 meters, so 10 to the two meters, this would give us, uh, if we had our hydrogen atom, we would have a grain of sand as the proton here and uh, the uh, electron orbiting around that proton and a hydrogen atom would be going in this end zone and then it'd be like we put another uh, another football field back to back uh, with uh, so, uh, so the length of the football field is like the radius uh, of the hydrogen atom for a grain of sand that's playing the role of the proton in the middle and you can see that the marching band is out there i was a marching band person myself in high school and college not at um but so then we fast forward more than half a century to the late 1960s. They were doing really similar experiments, uh, scattering electrons off of protons at the Stan Stanford Linear Accelerator Center in California. 
Uh, at this point, we have the technology to um, produce higher energy electron beams, high enough energy to do inelastic scattering off of the proton, so to break it up. And they also found that many of these electrons bounced back at sharp angles from the proton. And they looked at the kinematic, they just reconstructed, so sort of two-body kinematics, and they saw that those electrons were not bouncing off of the whole proton, but rather off of subcomponents. So this led to the conclusion that protons are not solid lumps of positive charge. And the constituents that make up the proton are now called quarks. And we don't actually know, uh, we, we've never measured with any um, finite value, any, any value that was significantly different from zero, the radius of a quark or of an electron, but they're constrained to be uh, less than 10 to the minus uh, 18 meters. So the simplest model of the proton says that it's made of three so-called valence quarks. Uh, they're called valence um, to be similar to the valence electrons in chemistry. So the valence electrons are the ones that determine the chemical properties of an element. And the valence quarks of a strong force bound state are the ones that determine the main properties of uh, a strong force bound state. In this case, uh, we're talking about the proton. So uh, the simplest model with these three valence quarks, the three valence quarks uh, include two up flavored quarks and one down flavored quark. And flavor is the charge that couples to the weak force. Um, there are six different flavors of quarks. So the weak force uh, sees these differently. They're called up and down. This is what protons and neutrons are primarily made of, or these are the valence quarks in protons and neutrons, up and down quarks. And then there are heavier ones that are only found in unstable bound states of the strong force, so known as charm, strange, and bottom. So strange was the third one that they found, and uh, they were not expecting it, and that led to the name. And charm was predicted, so they were very pleased with themselves when they found it in the 1970s and gave it a, a more a positive name. Uh, and then top and bottom, once, once people had found charm and strange, they predicted top and bottom. And the top was only found in the 1990s, just as I was starting uh, to study physics as a freshman uh, undergrad myself. Top is so heavy, it uh, doesn't, it um, sort of decays before it has any time to form bound states. But all the other five do form bound states. Uh, these quarks are not completely free in the proton or in any other bound state they, they might form. They're bound by force carrier particles called gluons, and gluons really were named after glue. Uh, something known as C quarks are also present. These are short lived quark anti quark pairs uh, from quantum mechanical fluctuations. So, every proton and neutron of everything in your everyday life of your own body actually has antimatter in it. You have quark anti quark pairs flipping in and out of existence all the time in the nucleus of every atom of yeah, your own body, for example. So if you think about a nucleus, you've got uh, a bunch for heavy nuclei or anything other than hydrogen, right? You've got multiple protons, which all have positive electric charge, and then you have neutrons, which, okay, um, they're neutral, but um, they're not uh, counterbalancing the positive charge repulsion that should be there, and that is there, uh, among the protons. So the electromagnetic force should cause the protons to repel one another. But uh, uh, the strong force uh, is attracting them, and it's strong enough to overcome the electromagnetic force by about two orders of magnitude. Uh, and it's about 10 to the 38 uh, times stronger than the gra gravitational force, so thus the name, the strong force. But it has very, very short range of about 10 to the minus 15 meters. So this was the radius of a proton. The uh, radius of a proton is about uh, 0 0.8 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. And actually there's an inch, I don't work on it directly, but there's currently, a, let's see, I think it's a six sigma discrepancy, a few digits out in uh, the radius of the proton. So it's 0.8 something something and the techniques using uh, electron beams, uh, well, using electrons and using muons have this discrepancy, which people are currently investigating, but it's still about 10 to the minus 15 meters. So strong, the strong force acts on particles that carry color charge. This includes the quarks, 
plus the gluons themselves, which is a really important difference from electromagnetism. So if we think of the photon as the force carrier particle for electromagnetism, uh, so you know, electromag uh, electromagnetically charged particles will attract or repel because they are exchanging photons. That's what the quantum field theory for electromagnetism, uh, quantum electrodynamics tells us. But photons are electrically neutral, right? They don't carry electric charge. The gluons do carry strong force charge, this color charge. And this makes um, the study of the strong force a lot more complicated, but also a lot richer in many ways than studying uh, electromagnetic systems. It's called color, um, so it, I mean, it's not, you can't see anything if you used optical light to, uh, somehow, which, um, which you can even really resolve things at these really, really small distances. So it, um, color is just because they saw in the 1970s when they were developing the theory of the strong force that they needed three different charges to combine to make a neutral. So this again is in contrast to electromagnetism where we have two charges to make a neutral. We call them positive and negative or plus and minus. And in for the strong force, they saw that you needed three charges to make a neutral. And so they thought of the analogy of red, green, and blue light combining to make neutral white light, and they called it color. So because color is this, um, the term for the charge that couples to the strong force, the theory describing the strong force, the quantum field theory, is known as quantum chromodynamics. Note that quarks also carry fractional electric charge, which I personally think must be uh, something, something sort of deep that we don't understand yet. And so the proton, I said the, the valence quarks, the ones responsible for the main properties of the proton, are two up uh, flavored quarks and one down. So up quarks carry positive two two thirds electric charge and down quarks carry minus one third. So plus two thirds plus two thirds minus a third equals a net charge of plus one. For the proton, the neutron valence quarks are two downs and an up. So we have minus a third minus a third plus two thirds equals zero, the neutral electric charge of the neutron. So if you think of an atom, you can break up an atom into its constituent. You can knock an electron off, you can measure that electron, you can take all the electrons off and have a bare nucleus. So you can um, break a nucleus apart into its protons and neutrons, but uh, if you, and, and measure and work with those um, freed neutrons and protons. Uh, if you try to knock a quark or a gluon out of a, a proton or a neutron, uh, you don't end up with a free quark due to something known as confinement. Uh, and so this is another special feature of the strong force. So quarks and gluons are confined to composite, composite color neutral particles. They come in groups of three quarks uh, in which in any instant, uh, one of the three valence quarks would be red, one green, and one blue. Uh, but these aren't uh, associated. The color of a quark is not fixed. They're always being exchanged with the gluons. Remember the gluons carry color charge themselves. So when two quarks exchange a gluon, they're also exchanging color. So we don't say, oh, you know, the down quark is the blue one and the two up quarks are red and green because they're always flip-flopping, exchanging their colors. But in any instant, uh, you would have uh, one red, one green, one blue to make a color neutral down state of three quarks. These are called baryons. So the Greek prefix uh, bary for uh, heavy, um, like bariatric surgery, for example or quark anti-quark pairs, uh, and these would be in any instant, uh, one, the, the quark would be carrying a color and the anti-quark would be car carrying the corresponding anti-color. So red anti-red, green anti-green, blue anti-blue. And these are called mesons, meso for middle, middle weight particles. If you try to pull two quarks apart, the energy between them increases until you produce a new quark anti-quark pair through e equals mc squared. And you can kind of think of this as stretching an elastic band. So uh, the farther you pull, you stretch an elastic band, the stronger the restoring force, right? So again, this is very different from electromagnetism or gravity where you have one over R squared force laws. So the, the force between two electrically charged objects or two, the gravitational force between two massive bodies um, gets smaller very rapidly as you move farther apart. 
Here we have something where as you get farther apart, you are, you're increasing the force between them. So it's like you're stretching that elastic band, you are increasing the uh, restoring force, you're storing potential energy in the elastic band. Um, and uh, at some point you would break your elastic band and that, that potential energy that was stored in it goes into breaking that elastic band and the pieces snap away from each other. So it's a somewhat similar idea for quantum chromodynamics. If you try to separate two quarks, here's a charm and an anti-charm quark in this example, you have this uh, energy, potential energy stored between them that's increasing as they get farther apart. And then uh, through equals mc squared, that potential energy is turned into mass energy and we create new massive quark anti quark pair. And then those new, the new quark and anti quark that were just produced as a pair can bind to the separating um, charm quark and anti charm quark in this case to form two new bound states. So this, these particles, for example, would be known as uh, positive and negative D mesons. So. so for more information on quarks, gluons, and the strong force, I would point you to the Particle Adventure website. And actually, a lot of the pictures from the previous pages were borrowed from that site. It's a pretty nice introduction to the standard model of particle physics. So one of the overarching questions in my research is how do we understand the visible matter in our universe? So protons, neutrons, uh, helium, stars, everything familiar from our everyday world. In terms of the fundamental quarks and gluons described by our theory of the strong force, quantum chromodynamics. So if you think about um, being sensitive to different length scales, <laughs> I kind of think about uh, what size pothole will bother you. Ann Arbor, um, I moved to Ann Arbor from the Metro New York area in 2012, and I really like it in Ann Arbor. Uh, but one of the things I definitely don't like is the very poor condition of the roads here in, uh, in Michigan, maybe more generally. Uh, so I spend more time worrying about potholes here than I used to. And you can think about what size potholes will bother you if you are driving or riding you know, a tank. If you go to do your food shopping, your grocery shopping, in a tank and you've got potholes in the street, you won't notice most of them at all. You need a really big pothole before it bothers uh, your, your tank tread because of the length scale right, of, of the tread. Instead, you're driving a car, you're going to be sensitive to potholes the size of the tires of the car. If you've ever noticed people with jogging strollers uh, pushing their kid around while they're jogging and how jogging strollers look different than walking strollers, strolling strollers. You know, the, the regular strollers have a lot smaller wheels. And so there's a reason that the jogging strollers have larger wheels. It's so that you don't have to worry so much about all the little holes in the street uh, the same way you would with even smaller wheels. And you know, if you're on something like a skateboard, <laughs> a lot of those potholes, basically every one is gonna, is gonna get you because of the length scale of, of your wheel. And so um, things that you wouldn't even be aware of if you have, if you're going with your tank treads, you're going to be really acutely aware of uh, many more things with your really small wheels on your skateboard. And so uh, I want to <clears throat> have something analogous to those wheels to, gauge, to give me sensitivity to 10 to the minus 15 meter distance scales. So if we think of the electromagnetic spectrum, as we increase in energy, we are decreasing the wavelength. And uh, so if we think of, if you think of visible microscopy, so uh, high school bio lab, you are able to use regular, regular light, optical light, visible light to look at microorganisms. And this is because the length scales of those microorganisms are, um, are larger or similar to the length scales of the wavelengths of visible light, which is about 400 to 700 nanometers. If you want to be able to resolve molecules and then atoms, you'll need to go to shorter wavelengths, such as ultraviolet light and then x-rays. And people do in fact use um, sources of ultraviolet light and x-rays to study the molecular and atomic structure of matter respectively. So ultraviolet light has wavelengths of about 10 to 400 nanometers. X-rays have wavelengths of about 0.01 to 10 nanometers. 
And these are appropriate distance scales to be sensitive to molecular and atomic structure of matter. And there are dedicated facilities uh, around the world um, that uh, uh, produce, that are dedicated to producing beams of ultraviolet light and even more so, uh, even more facilities, beams of X-ray light to do um, the structure of matter. So for example, I don't remember how many years ago now, but uh, you know, the structure of RNA uh, you know, was given a, a Nobel Prize, and this was um, determined using X-ray, using X-rays. So now I want to study nucleon protons. We said that these were 10,000 to 100,000 times smaller than atoms. So I am going to need high energy particle accelerators to see inside them, uh, taking advantage of wave particle duality to get to these very, very short wavelengths. So uh, two of my main experiments are the Phoenix experiment at the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider at Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island, New York, and the Large Hadron Collider Beauty experiment at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva, Switzerland. You can see, so Phoenix I'll show in a minute is uh, around here. Uh, the LHCB experiment um, is over here. What you're seeing from above is uh, not the actual ring, it's the access, the road where you drive your car on uh, to go to different access points along the ring. And here it's really just a line. This is the tunnels are buried uh, about 100 meters underground. LHCB is right at the French, uh, right on the French side of the French Swiss border. And here you can see the Geneva airport. So you could actually basically walk from the LHCB experimental point to the Geneva airport if you were allowed to cross the border from France into Switzerland on foot there. Uh, the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider is the only active particle collider in the US. You can see that ring road from satellite photos from space. Um, this is Manhattan here, uh, Brooklyn and Queens, and then there are two counties farther east on Long Island. Uh, so uh, Brookhaven National Lab and the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider are in um, one of these further eastern counties. Uh, by 2030, it'll actually be transformed into a new uh, new facility. So the government just announced in January of this year that uh, they were going to go forward with this new two, $2 billion dollar scale collider in the United States, which was really exciting news. I've been involved in the first time I gave a presentation at a dedicated meeting to this facility it was in 2002 as a graduate student. So I've personally been involved for 18 years already, and uh, we hope to get first data 10 years from now. So it, it, takes, um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of people uh, to, uh, to make these really large science facilities happen. Uh, so yeah, the Electron Ion Collider User Group uh, is currently comprised of 238 institutions from 32 countries. And I'm one of the 10 people on the steering committee uh, leading this effort. So it's been really exciting the last several months to see things uh, suddenly advancing really rapidly after the government approved this project. Uh, so the idea of the electron ion collider, they're going to add an electron beam to the existing relativistic heavy ion collider. Uh, and I've been doing my research at the relativistic heavy ion collider since 2001, actually. It's really a great place to be if you want to study protons and the strong force. So we are studying pr protons, the internal structure of protons. We're studying the internal structure of nuclei. We're also studying nuclear matter so hot and dense that the quarks and gluons are briefly deconfined into what's known as a quark gluon plasma. Uh, the facility can run or does run two colliding beams of ions. They're, they're called ions um, because uh, people, the government, it's a government lab, uh, the government uh, thinks that people in the US are very mistrustful of things with the term nuclear in them. Uh, so we don't call it the relativistic heavy nuclear collider or heavy nucleus collider. We call them ions, but uh, anybody coming from chemistry would find these really bizarre ions. So we take all the electrons off. So we run with gold a lot, and um, gold is atomic number 79. So it has 79 protons. We strip off all 79 electrons and run just the bare gold nuclei. And we've even gone up to uranium nuclei. Uh, the collider has been running since the year 2000. So these large scale facilities tend to have, um, I mean, they cost uh, a significant amount of money, but then you have a community of about a thousand people working at this facility. 
there'll be a little bit more at the electron ion collider. Uh, and you run them for 20 years uh, or so. So it's 2020. This facility has been running since uh, 2000, and it'll keep running until 2025 when it'll shut down um, to, uh, for construction to build the electron ion collider at the same site. Uh, so yeah, here's a photo of a part of the collaboration. You can see the detector magnet here in the back uh, when things weren't uh, are open, very open for maintenance. Uh, it, the Phoenix experiment involves 14 countries, uh, 73 different institutions, so universities and labs, about 500 participants. And it's about four, the detector is about four stories tall, 40 feet long, weighs about 3,000 tons. We have a bunch, uh, you can see this is, this is open for maintenance. Here, this is a magnet. This is painted green. This is a beam pipe uh, coming in. It gets narrower when um, uh, closer to the collision point. You can see somebody working down here to give you a sense of scale. And then we have different layers of, uh, of different subsystems, different uh, types of detectors for measuring different kinds of produced particles or different information about them, such as their electric charge, their momentum, their energy, their particle types. The reason we have a magnet here is because we want charged particles that are produced in the collisions to bend in the magnetic field, and then we measure their trajectory. So we measure the radius of curvature in order to reconstruct their momentum, uh, basic in M. Uh, yeah, we were featured on the cover of Physics Today uh, some number of years ago, which was pretty exciting. And currently, um, we are building what's known as the S Phoenix detector, S for super. Uh, I don't think that's a great name. And, didn't vote for it, but uh, I was outvoted. So it's the Super Phoenix detector. This is currently under construction and we'll start taking data in 2023. My group is involved in this as well. And just, we were super lucky right before the pandemic on March 6th, we finished uh, 15 months of testing um, tens of thousands of silicon photomultipliers uh, that are gonna be used to measure the light output of the electromagnetic and hadronic perimeters of the energy measuring detectors in this experiment. So it was pure coincidence that we finished the first week of March, um, but it was really just, just in time before everything shut down. So one of my other main experiments is the Large Hadron Collider Beauty experiment. So I didn't tell you before, but uh, the top and bottom quarks are also known as truth and beauty for those who are a bit more poetically inclined including my collaborators who founded this experiment prior to my joining it. I only joined in 2017 and the, this experiment has been taking data since uh, like 2010, so already for a decade. Uh, so uh, at the Large Hadron Collider, we run proton-proton collisions up to center of mass energies of 13 tera electron volts. The maximum energy of the relativistic heavy ion collider is, um, is half, uh, you know, 0.51. Uh, tera electron volts, but we have uh, polarization of the beams at the relativistic heavy ion collider, which I'll talk about more in a minute. At the LHC, we also run proton lead and lead lead collisions. The experiment design of LHCB focuses on studying charge parity symmetry violation and charm. And I wrote bottom because that's what I'm used to calling it, but they would say, my, my collaborators would say beauty, uh, beauty quark states, and that's what this B is for. Uh, you, it's unique at the Large Hadron Collider and that the detector is um, in the far forward region. It's not centered around the point where the protons collide. So it's a different, um, different kinematic coverage. And, and it was designed to do this for the, the flagship physics program, which is not my physics. Uh, you know, I'm studying proton structure and quantum chromodynamics, so, but the detector design that was optimized for these other physics uh, programs, the main ones of my 800 something collaborators, uh, actually works really well for many of the things I want to measure. So yeah, we've got uh, about 850 scientists. Uh, here uh, we are in the experimental hall. It's a little bit hard to see things. You're mainly seeing uh, scaffolding here. Um, and here you can see an event display. So, I mean, what we measure are basically hits, like charge deposited in different layers of uh, the detector, and energy deposited in different layers of the detector. And so this is a computer generated image where we um, have software to connect the hits, uh, to convert, um, to, to measure the energy and infer these tracks. 
So we don't measure continuous tracks. We measure, it's like connect the dots, if you will. And you have to not get mixed up about which dots go with which because, um, because, uh, because it's not always obvious which ones you are, are corresponding to the same particle passing through along its way. So uh, I said before that we can't see individual quarks and gluons. Note that a, a collective term for quark or gluon is parton. Uh, so how do you determine the proton structure if we can't just take out a quark and, and measure it? Well, we do use inelastic scattering. We shoot a high energy beam, uh, for example, of electrons. It's a little bit easier to think of electrons, even though I, I, right now I work mainly with proton-proton collisions. But since um, I'm shooting two composite objects at one another, it's a little bit easier to think of shooting an electron, which um, has no substructure that we are sensitive to, so far at least. Uh, so the electron stays intact uh, and then breaks up the other proton, breaks up the proton. So we shoot a high energy beam at the proton to break it up and we try to understand what happens. Uh, if we have an electron beam, the electron exchanges a photon with the quarks, because remember the quarks carry that fractional electromagnetic charge as well as color charge. And the language we've, dis we've developed so far to describe proton structure is in terms of parton distribution functions. You can think of them as the probability of scattering off of a parton, so a quark or a gluon, carrying a particular, a particular fraction x of the proton's momentum. And if you're wondering, well, what if the proton's at rest and I'm just shooting a beam at it, like the original experiments at Stanford, uh, recall that um, we are going to be discussing things in the center of mass frame. So even if protons are in a stationary target, they're going to have non-zero momentum in the center of mass frame. So here I have my incoming electron, here I have my proton, and uh, I've just uh, depicted something really simple of a three valence quark picture. I have inelastic scattering with the proton. I'm going to break up the proton, but I effectively have elastic scattering with a quark inside it. So since I have elastic scattering with the electron and the quark, I can just use really simple conservation of energy and momentum. Uh, to infer the information about the quark in the instant and scattered from within the proton, as long as I measure, I, I control my initial uh, electron um, energy and momentum, uh, its momentum direction, and I measure the scattered electrons energy and angle. And this is enough to, um, it's two to two, it's two body scattering, two body elastic scattering. So I can figure out what momentum that proton was carrying in the moment it got struck. So a little bit more about these parton distribution functions inside of a proton, or you have, do, you have similar things for, a new, for quark distributions inside a neutron. So if you think of this electron scattering off of quarks inside protons, or off of the proton as a black box, right? I don't know what's in my proton, let's say. So what momentum fraction would the scattering constituent carry if the proton were made of a point particle? So if the pro proton were a point particle, I have my electron beam coming in, I scatter it off of my proton black box, something inside my proton black box. I reconstruct the two to two body kinematics. Um, and I see that whatever I hit inside my proton black box was carrying 100% of the total proton momentum. This is what I would see if I just had a proton, uh, if the proton were a point particle, that 100% of the time uh, I would get um, I would find that I scattered off of something that carried 100% of the proton's momentum. If instead the proton consisted of three non-interacting valence quarks that each carried uh, exactly one third of the proton's momentum, every time I scatter, I'm, I'm going to get a, a delta function, right? Now at one third of the total proton's momentum. Every time I scatter, I'm going to scatter off of one of these, and I'm going to see that what I scattered off of was carrying exactly a third. If I now have three bound valence quarks, so that on average, they're each carrying one third of the proton's momentum, but they can trade off momentum with one another a bit by exchanging gluons, I'm gonna get a peak at one third, but it's gonna be smeared out. I'm gonna have some probability of um, scattering off of a quark that carried a bit more or a bit less than a third of the proton's momentum. And now if I allow for quantum mechanical fluctuations, these um, the radiation of a gluon that splits into a quark-antiquark -quark pair that then will later recombine. Um, but if I have a, a high enough energy and sort of fast enough time scales to resolve these kind of processes, 
on average, these are going to be carrying smaller momentum fractions. So I'm going to see I have increased my probability of scattering off of something that was carrying a smaller momentum fraction, you know, less than a third of uh, my proton's momentum. This is from a textbook uh, by Halsen and Martin. Uh, what does it look like compared to experimental data? What is uh, how, what does the real data say compared to that uh, sort of schematic picture? So we have a wealth of data largely thanks to the proton electron collider called HERA that was in Hamburg, Germany and ran from 1992 to 2007. So here we have the fraction of the overall proton momentum carried by a particular quark type. Um, and uh, here we have our up quarks, our down quarks, uh, anti-up and anti-down are here, uh, and our gluons. So if you look at the up and down, they are peaked. So this is a log plot. So 10%, 20%, 30%. So they're shifted down a little bit below a third, but they're still, you know, something like 20. This would be 20%, so 15% of the protons uh, total momentum. And then you have uh, increase as you go to lower momentum fractions, you increase the probability of scattering off of these antiquarks. And uh, what was a surprise uh, was that uh, the gluons uh, are, play such a big role, carry so much of the proton's momentum. So conclusions from decades of inelastic scattering data investigating proton momentum structure show that three uh, valence quarks carry on average the largest single momentum fractions of the proton, but we have lots of gluons and C quark antiquark pairs in the proton as well. And we found that gluons carry about 50% of the total momentum of the proton. And despite all the excitement in the last eight years about the Higgs boson, which gives uh, mass to particles such as the electron, uh, it does, the, the gluon interactions are actually responsible for more than 98% of the mass of protons and neutrons, and therefore more than 98% of the mass of the visible universe. So basically through E equals MC squared. So I just told you about the momentum distribution of quarks inside the proton and the vast majority of the past five decades have been focused on this one dimensional momentum structure. Since the 1990s, we've been starting to consider the fact that the quarks actually jiggle around a little bit in the proton. They're not just moving exactly collinear, exactly parallel with the proton's momentum direction. Uh, but we can also ask about other distributions, uh, not just about uh, the momentum distribution of the quarks. So we can ask about the spin distributions of the quarks and how do the um, how do we get the total spin one half h bar of of the proton? We didn't have the ability to study polarized protons until basically the 1980s for technological reasons. But how the angular momentum of quarks and gluons add up to the total spin of one half h bar of the proton is still not completely understood. We can ask about flavor distribution. So the up versus the down quarks, the anti up versus the anti down, strange and charm quarks that are blipping in and out of existence. We have good measurements of flavor distributions in the valence region, uh, but the flavor structure for the C quarks is still yielding surprises in the, 20, in the 2000s. I have a paper submitted to Nature right now under review about that. And then position, you might think, okay, position, momentum, phase space should be the easiest or very natural things to, to think about. We had no clue how to describe, describe theoretically or experimentally access the position of a quark until the mid 1990s. So, um, you know, the proton has a finite radius, it's small, but it's about 0 0.8 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. You can ask, what's the probability of scattering off of an up quark that is 0.1 times 10 to the minus 15 meters from the center of my proton? And we only figured, you know, had ideas on how to do that in the mid 1990s. And there have been what I would call pioneering measurements over the past decade. This will be a big program at the electron ion collider. And then there's color. This was accounted for theoretically from the beginning of QCD. But more detailed, potentially observable effects of color flow have come to the forefront in the last decade. So a few words on spin for those who haven't taken quantum mechanics yet. Spin is a quantum mechanical property of fundamental particles or combinations of particles. It's called spin because it's a type of angular momentum and is described by equations treating angular momentum. The units of angular momentum are the same as Planck's constant h bar and can only have values that are integers, so 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, times h bar or half integer. 
Uh, quarks like protons have spin one half of h bar. And in a magnetic field, different spin states have different energies, but have the same magnitude of the angular momentum. And pro proton spin specifically is what makes the medical diagnostic technique of magnetic resonance imaging possible. So something I uh, only briefly mentioned before is that the relativistic heavy ion collider is actually blocked here with the photos. It says Rick as a polarized collider, polarized proton collider. So it's the world's first and only um, collider that has the ability to control the spin direction of the proton beams. So this was thanks to the development of a lot of different technologies from the 1970s to the 1990s. So being, uh, this allows us to look at spin-spin and spin-momentum correlations in, uh, in the proton and other strong force bound states. Uh, so, so far I just was talking about moment. So these, these sketches here, the, the large circle represents the proton, the small circle represents a quark inside it, and all the arrows represent um, spin direction of either the proton or the quark. So what I was talking about so far, I was talking about momentum distributions in uh, of unpolarized quarks in unpolarized protons, or you know, we weren't paying any, any attention to whether they, what, what the spin directions were. But if I do pay attention, uh, I can ask about spin-spin correlations. So now this becomes, all these others are difference in probabilities. What's the difference in probability of scattering off of a longitudinally polarized quark in a longitudinally polarized proton. So the beam direction is considered to be horizontal. So this, these horizontal arrows are parallel to the direction of momentum, parallel or anti-parallel. So longitudinally polarized quark in a longitudinally polarized proton, where the quark polarization is the same versus the opposite. What's the difference in probability now of scattering off of these two? You can do the same thing for transverse-transverse spin polarization. And then you can look at spin momentum correlations. Uh, here we have What's the, you can think of these as spin orbit correlations. What's the probability of finding a quark that orbits in one direction versus the other direction when the proton is polarized in, um, in the transverse plane to the beam momentum, for example. And there you can do mixing and matching of the spin of the quark, the spin of the, the proton, uh, and, and get you get five different distributions. What matters though, and they have different names, uh, we go a little bit faster. What matters though isn't that you can just take all the common, do your combinatorics and write down some nice things uh, on a piece of paper. What matters is whether these spin spin and spin momentum correlations are actually non zero in nature. And we have a lot of evidence from electron and muon nucleon scattering experiments over the past 15 years that many of them are non zero as well as from um, the facility, the relativistic heavy ion collider facility. So this is actually one it comes from uh, my work at the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. So this is a spin-spin correlation that we found. So that we found that the, um, uh, the gluons, uh, the gluon spin contributes to a proton spin. Gluons carry one unit of H-bar, they're bosons. So this was a press release in 2014, uh, also from that same period. Gluons chip in for the pro for proton spin. Here's a picture of the Phoenix detector at Brookhaven National Lab, uh, uh, open for maintenance. And here you can see data from other experiments so that looks at spin momentum correlations. Don't worry about so exactly what's being shown. Just look at the magnitude of the effects. So this is about five, five, seven percent, and the different collision systems. This is electron beam, electron proton collisions, and muon proton collisions. We've seen these five to seven percent uh, spin momentum correlation effects. This is a different set of spin momentum correlations. Again, sort of five, seven uh, percent effects. So um, you, don't, you don't need to do your experiment 10,000 times to measure a five percent effect. Of course, you want to measure it as much as possible to beat down your statistical uncertainties, but a five percent effect is actually pretty easy. Here's yet another set of, this is a spin-spin correlation and a um, convoluted with a spin momentum correlation. Again, we see sort of five, seven percent level effect. Um, However, in proton-proton collisions with one of the protons tra transversely polarized, we actually see really, really big, up to 40% spin momentum correlations. Um, so this was a big surprise when it was originally discovered in 1976, actually. It has, and this was at very low energies where people couldn't even really use a quark picture of the proton. Uh, the proton mass is about one GeV. 
uh, over C squared. Uh, so this is the center of mass energy of the collisions at Argonne National Lab near Chicago. It was only about five times the mass of the proton, and then you're breaking it up and producing particles with lower energies. Um, so the, but there are these really striking asymmetries. This is in the production of mesons, known as pions. The filled circles are for positive pions. The open ones are for negative pions. It's actually a really simple conceptual experiment once you have the technology to have the polarized beam. At a transversely polarized beam hitting a stationary unpolarized target, it was actually just a beryllium hunk of metal, and they produced these charged pions, these quark anti quark pair particles, and they saw that up, uh, you can see my video, uh, up to 40% more of when you had the beam polarized up, the proton spin in the, of the beam, proton beam polarized up, um, they saw up to 40% more of the positive ions went to the left and up to then to the right and up to 20% of the negative pions um, went to the right, the opposite side. It's like a left-right asymmetry. So it's the momentum direction of the produced particles that's correlated with the spin of the proton beam. And this was confirmed even at much higher energies at the relativistic heavy ion collider. So this proton-proton uh, collisions are a more complicated process than electron scattering off of protons. But we have these really striking effects that go well beyond the already pretty sizable 5-7% correlations I showed you before using electron and muon beams. Muon is like a heavy electron. And so uh, one of the hypotheses that I am actively looking into, uh, though I won't have time to talk about it today, is whether these huge effects, these huge spin momentum correlations when I have proton-proton collisions instead of electron-proton collisions, are related to quantum color entanglement of quarks across the colliding protons. So just finishing up here, I wanted to say a, a few words to acknowledge my group. Uh, so group members in the fall of 2020, I actually have a lot of undergrads working with my group right now, Billy Liu, Chen Shu Wang, uh, Chris Platt, Bob Song, Liam Blanchard, Sean Mus Muskaitis, Jacob Rapucci, Varsh Rangan, Al Kusich, and Nicole Kukta. I have five PhD students working with me, Kara Mattioli, Jordan Roth, Cynthia Nunez, Desmond Shangase, and Dylan Fitzgerald, postdocs Sakeem Lee, and two visiting scholars, Dylan Manna and Devin Loomis. And we haven't gotten so many good group photos lately, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, but we did meet once in uh, August, so those of us who were in Ann Arbor uh, for a walk in the arm, and here you can see us with all of our masks, and here, this is from uh, the summer before, actually, uh, with a slightly different set of people, some of whom have uh, graduated and moved on. So it's the undergrad, uh, Micah Johnson, just graduated uh, this past spring, and he actually was still here in August. And Kevin Moser was uh, with us uh, over the summer as well. So this brings me to my summary. Even though protons are a fundamental building block of everyday matter, we still have lots to learn about the complex behavior of the quarks and gluons inside them. In recent years, things have been developing rapidly as we've discovered new questions we can ask about proton structure and have come up with ideas to perform relevant measurements. And there's a community of a couple thousand people around the world that's working to unravel the mysteries of the proton and the strong force that holds it together. So thank you very much. <laughs>